Yes. This will be the most amazing part of this talk, hopefully not. Very quickly about me, um, did a PhD one year ago, uh, was a, a strength and conditioning coach for a short time, currently working as a um, sports scientist in a hospital, so currently a practi practitioner. And um, I'm a big open science enthusi enthusiast. I don't think everyone should be like me, um, but at least I tried to apply certain aspects that I'm talking about. So I have some kind of experience I'm not sure if I would call myself an expert, but we will see. Um, so basically, I, I'm just sharing some of my experiences. Some acknowledgements, um, the, the quality of this presentation wouldn't be the way it is today without um, intensive discussions and preparations with my colleagues, especially Robin Schaefer, Drs. Romy Twomey and Chris McCrum, and also Nicola Volk, who helped me prepare everything today and also get the technical aspects running like the poll that we do afterwards. What this workshop part is about, like my last, my last aspect, I mainly want to give a primer on the topic of open science. I also want to invade debate on the topic, also in a part of a group work. And I want to share a personal uh, experience report. So this, I didn't do a systematic review before to tell you the best and accurate state of the literature. I'm just sharing you what I've uh, come across in the last month and years. So the learning objectives after the session, you should be able to know a little bit better what open science is. You should know about some of the limitations of the current research practices or publication practices. You should know about uh, individual benefits that you can gain from applying open, ex uh, open science. And you, had, you should um, be aware of some tools where you, should where, where you are able to get started when you leave the session. That's the basic learning objectives. Um, we will see if I'm able to meet these objectives. I will do so by giving a, a small introductory talk on the topic. Then we will have a larger proportion of time to do some group work where you can get together and discuss on what you can do at the moment. And afterwards, I will also give you a short uh, working example of how you can apply open science practices throughout the entire research process so that it's not a problem of uh, you don't know how to do it. First of all, I want to start, please take out your smartphones with a very brief poll, mainly two questions. Um, I would like to know basically how much you know about open science at the moment, and also how confident you are currently to apply open science practices in your own. To do so, because we're also doing this later on, I want to match your responses. This is why we need a short participant ID. I hope this is relatively um, anonymous, but I will also anonymize the, the responses afterwards. So please type in for the participant ID first and last name uh, for first and last letter of the last name of the first name and then the four digits for day and month of your birthday. All right. Um, also press uh, the multiple choice section if you're doing the poll right now at the beginning of the workshop and later on you will select um, that you're doing the poll afterwards. All right. And just give me the, the two ratings on the two questions or the two statements below. Right, so this is basically our, this is basically our baseline. Um, we are using this poll data to um, run a small study where I show you afterwards how we could go with all the data and so on. Um, hopefully everything works out as planned. So to start with the introductory talk, what is open science? Of course, there are a couple of um, definitions. For example, the open science is often considered to be a movement um, to make scientific research, data and dissemination accessible to everyone that's interested. Um, most of, uh, very often, we also consider several principles associated with open science. For example, things like transparency, reusability, reproducibility are very often associated with open science. But we also have many practices, research practices that are also associated with open science. So we have principles and practices, things like publishing open access, uh, sharing data, materials, code, um, open education resources and so on and so far. So open science can be a lot and I will give you just a, a brief overview of some of these things. But also to understand what is open science and why do we need it potentially, I think it's good um, to talk about what is science, what is research and just a very personal um, definition for myself, how I think about science. So I think about this as um, systematic activities or research, um, systematic activities to expand our knowledge by using rigorous methodology and also to derive robust results. I think this is one of the key essence, or these are one of the key essences, what the scientific process, what science or research means. But we have to be aware, and this was also mentioned in the previous talks today, 
Um, that research is more or less equivalent to the published literature because what is not published, no one knows about this. If it's not in the scientific record, except the research group, no one knows what happened. So basically research is the published li literature because everyone else, we cannot know about this. So therefore, if we want to evaluate quality of research, we also can only evaluate the published literature. We cannot evaluate how the study went. We only can evaluate what has been published about how the study went. And if there are some things missing, we cannot evaluate the entire process of research. We can only evaluate what happened um, when it's written down. So therefore the question is, is open science good science? Um, I think the answer is no, because you can be very open and transparent and still conduct a poor quality study. Um, but on the other hand, if we want to be able to evaluate the quality of a study, is the study, is the research good? then we need to be open and transparent because otherwise no one is able to evaluate. We can only say something is good if we have enough information to judge the goodness, the, the quality of a study or of, of research. This is at least is my understanding. So um, I think in a, in a broader sense, good science needs, needs to fulfill some aspects of openness because otherwise no one knows. Or it's trust. Um, the, the regular research process is often displayed in various aspects. So for example, usually we have a problem. Sometimes we specify hypothesis. Um, we do a plan, study design, collect data, analyze data, draw some conclusions afterwards, and then try to publish the results. And therefore um, publishing in a broader sense, like we disseminate and debate about what happened in a broader sense. And open science is just trying to be open about all aspects of the process. So the question is, why do we need it? Or why, why isn't it there, or is it there? Um, like the basic idea is what we mentioned, or what I mentioned before. Um, science is basically like uh, what, what, what is written in the literature. And there are some arguments and some thoughts and also some evidence um, that we have some kind of publication filter. Not every research that has been conducted will be published. So therefore we don't see everything, that is clear. For example, what could be invisible for readers are uh, selective reporting. So we only report results that are significant and the other ones are not interesting enough. For example, um, some journals explicitly state that this should be done or stated. Um, also, what could be a little bit uh, biased on the publication is, for example, we collect some data and afterwards draw some uh, and afterwards uh, hypothesize after the fact, um, which is also a little bit weird from the original idea of hypothesis for this research project. And of course, other aspects of publication bias. So it's just not interesting enough. So we don't take the effort, um, as Xavier said, uh, Xavier said um, to put all the work in to publish something that we don't find interesting anymore. Of course, so therefore the scientific literature is not a full representation of everything that happened. I think that's quite clear. Something that is uh, considerable is then if it turns out to be publication bias. So in an ideal world, um, scientific studies, statistical findings would look like this. So we have something like a more or less symmetrical distribution of findings of results, statistical results, um, which have some kind of bell shape. For example, the things that come quite close to this are um, a sample of randomized controlled trials from the Cochrane database, which is probably a relatively high quality. If, however, we look more broadly on what we find in the literature, for example, uh, the PubMed um, search who try to uh, who extract that um, Z values or statistical values, basically, or who, who derive statistical values, Z values from more than one will more, more than one million abstracts or papers, um, found that the results that are reported look, look, look more like this. So basically, um, if we look at a broader sense of the literature, not just Cochrane RCTs, we do see that we don't have this ideal distribution of effects that are reported in the literature. And this is what we call publication bias. And this is a quite, um, quite clear picture of what happens or what could happen. And what is missing there are results that would turn out to be non-significant. This is the gap that is missing there in, in the middle. If we talk about reproducible research, we can differentiate between different terms. So for example, to make this clear, reproducibility is usually associated, well, let me take this. It's usually associated with we're looking at the same data and perform the same analysis and came to the same results. 
So two people have the same data sets, the same analysis um, description at least, and get, get the same results. Robustness is that we have the same data, but perform different types of plausible analysis and also get the same results because we always have to take some decisions. Replicability is that we use different data, but the same way of analyzing the data and get robust results or replicable results. And generalizability is basically that we um, observe the similar phenomenon with different data and different types of analysis. But the phenomenon, the, the concept is quite strong. So we observe some different kinds of approaches, for example. If we take a look at some of these aspects uh, in our literature, and I'm mostly giving uh, examples from psychology because psychology is in this aspect a couple of years ahead from sports science. Um, they put great efforts in analyzing all these different aspects in their literature. So this is why I'm showing the, um, these results. So for example, looking at reproducibility, so having the same data and trying to come to the same conclusions. Um, there are some statistical tests that do that automatically with uh, the database searches, and they looked at statistical inconsistencies. So the statistical values that we report in, uh, in, in manuscripts, so for example, a p-value, an effect size, degrees of freedom, the f-test, and so on and so far, we check if these match up with each other because they are all interrelated. And if we properly report all the things that come out of a statistical project uh, program, there should be, they should make sense. However, when screening uh, more than 16,000 articles from psychology journals, they found at least one numerical inconsistency in half of the papers, or almost half of the papers. And on average, there were 10% of inconsistencies of the, of the results reported in uh, per article. So quite a substantial amount of just numbers don't matching up as how they are reported. If this is substantial or not for the conclusion is a totally different question, but at least the way um, Results are reported is not really consistent. We don't know if it's an error or not. Um, it's just not consistent. Same thing if we look at um, if we have rating scales, you can rate from zero to, uh, from zero to seven, for example, and we just calculate the mean. Depending on the sample size, we can also see are the are, are the mean values plausible? Can these mean values happen in the literature? And also there we find that there are statistical inconsistencies in roughly fifty percent of the of the data that we analyzed. So it's not even easy to um, check if the, the, the reported values do make sense when we compare them with each other. First aspect of reproducibility. More importantly, um, we are usually more interested in, okay, if we try to replicate findings, if we try to do more or less the same as originally proposed, do we find the same results? And here was a large um, uh, attempt also again in psychology where the working groups um, performed 100 replications of published research where, uh, where the research, the original re research was of high importance basically or considered to be of high importance, I think based on publication, stand, um, publication metrics and so on. And when replicating the original 100 studies, these are the p-values that were reported in the original studies and these are the p-values that are reported in the replication studies. Of course, p-values are not normally distributed so we expect some kind of, um, of, of shift or skewness but also if we look at, at the effect sizes, we do find on the left side, um, the average effect size of a correlation of 0.4, then turned out in the replications to be only half of the size. So the replications found for what, whichever reasons, only half of the effect size of the original ones. So repli replicability in these instances were not too great. Um, but this is not a problem specific to psychology where we may argue some of these um, effects that we study are a little bit more context related and so on and so far. These things also were documented in other sciences, uh, ecology, um, neuroscience, or preclinical cancer biology, for example. There was also a very, very large attempt where they had uh, huge amounts of funding. They aimed to have, I think, uh, a research time frame of roughly four years. They had to expand this to eight years to complete the study. Um, they originally aimed to replicate roughly 200 experiments. Um, based on the reports, none of the re replications could be started. So they needed to look for additional information to try to start the replication attempts. Um, they were able to initiate replications of roughly 90% of the experiments that they originally planned to do so. And due to several reasons, um, they could only 
complete 50 percent of the exper uh, 50 experiments from the original roughly 200 experiments that they aimed to try to replicate in cancer biology key essence here is not that we have a problem the key essence is it's extremely difficult to try to run the replication if we try to um, replicate someone else's findings there could be many many difficulties on the way to a successful replication uh, attempt um, that things that just turn out that we cannot replicate or cannot start to evaluate replicability. Again, if we look at the effect sizes in the upper panels, you always see the effect sizes of the original findings. And in the lower parts, you can see the effect size of the direct replications where they were able to perform replications. And again, you see even in preclinical pre -clin pre cancer biology, um, that we see a dramatic, dramatic um, reduction in effect sizes that turn out um, with replications. And this is something that we have to be aware. These are some aspects of the publication bias that happen if we try, if we do the enormous effort to get millions of uh, euros, uh, dollars, to try to replicate cancer biology. This is what uh, turned out um, when people tried to do this. The difficulty is, or the question would be, um, how does it look in sports science more broadly? Um, the problem is we don't have enough replication attempts or replications um, to, be to be able to evaluate this. Another proxy could be that we just look at the reporting from the literature so far. And there has been a relatively recent attempt um, looking at the nature of our literature where we looked at different um, reportings and uh, the, the positive result rates. So the basic aims of this study was to look at how many of the hypotheses that are stated in the literature um, how many are supported by the data? So how often were the authors correct, basically, what they state were the primary hypothesis? And we also looked at um, different reporting practices, basically, on an exploratory basis. We screened uh, 100 articles each from um, three society flagship journals of the ECSS, Sports Medicine Australia, and the ACSM, basically. So the journals you can see on the left side. There were three coders who coded all the 100 articles per um, Per journal and then we get a cumulative rating and we have an independent data analyst and the main result is as in other disciplines we do see if we look on the left hand side at the positive result rate so how many how often were the proposed hypothesis supported by the data and it turned out that it was the good news a little bit lower than in psychology psychology sometimes has um, positive result rates of 90 to 95 percent we are looking a little bit better, but still, this is um, unplausibly high. Based on, we are studying small sample sizes, small effects in many, many cases. We have good evidence for low powered studies. Um, it's completely implausible, or at least substantially implausible, that we find these high positive result rates. Further things that could be considered are, for example, if we look at other practices of statistical reporting, 90% um, of the articles that we screened reported some significance tests. Um, so basically, null hypothesis significance testing, um, even when there were no hypotheses tested in the study. So everything relies on testing hypothesis, even if we're doing exploratory stuff. Um, so this is just, uh, we should be aware of this. And if we look at, for example, um, pre-registering the, the study plan, before conducting the study. This is also very rarely reported. We don't know if people register their things, but we can only see what they report. And only 9% of the articles reported some kind of um, registration. And this is even more concerning if we look at clin clinical trials and randomized controlled trials, where per design, this is mandated. Per design, <clears throat> per design clinical trials and RCTs should have a registration before starting the data collection. And at least for some reason, people don't report it. Hopefully they have it, we don't know. But also we cannot evaluate what the original plan was and what they then did and reported from the studies. This is basically the thing. And also when trying to analyze, um, for, when trying to quantify publication bias, a recent attempt of looking at uh, roughly uh, 400 <coughs> studies or 400 effect sizes in sport and exercise medicines, we also observe this typical shape of publication bias in our statistical reportings, where non-significance results are underreported. So as an interim summary, um, we do have some evidence at least that some things are not ideal and can go wrong. Of course, this is otherwise we wouldn't be here. This is science, we need to progress. Um, but still there's uh, room for improvement. 
how could we improve basically to try to at least better understand what is happening? One possibility would be, for example, to apply pre-registration. So everyone is planning a study, just communicate what you planned with a registration basically, and everyone is able to check if this was really your original hypothesis or it's, if it's just exploratory. Everything is fine. Exploratory research is great um, and very, very, very important, but it's easy to be verifiable um, if you perform the pre-registration before starting the, the study. Also, it would be very, very helpful if we more clearly um, differentiate between exploratory and confirmatory results. I think psychology does a way better job at this. Um, it's also very, very important to just know your limitations and communicate them very clearly. And we now have the uh, new publication format, the registered reports, where this is more formalized. So basically we have a peer review process upon creation of the study idea and creating the methods. And based on the idea and the methods, we get a peer review. Do peers of ours evaluate our research aim and our research design valid to answer a question? And if this is accepted, basically, if we get a principal acceptance for this first stage, um, for this first stage review, we can go on, collect our data, fill in the report, and if we followed our plan, if we didn't deviate or have good explanations for deviating from our plan, the results will get published uh, no matter what the results. So at least we don't have publication bias based on the results because results look implausible. If we before decided we have very rigorous methodology to answer a question, then results should get published and should not go to the file drawer where non-significant results are not, um, not published. And the thing is, of course, everything can go wrong as always, but we have a possibility to evaluate what was originally said, which variables were described, and that the authors reported all the variables that they initially stated they want to collect. So it makes it easier. Also could help, for example, to try to share a little bit more of your data and materials, again, to allow quality control, to ev allow evaluation, um, and also to gain further insights. And does that help? Does it make any difference? If we look at the case of registered reports, so where we have two stages of review, basically, first methodology and then um, after the study was conducted. Surprisingly, we do find in registered reports, which you see on the left side, uh, the, the left figures, that we do find a substantially higher amount of null results. Non-significant findings, non-significant statistics are more often reported than in the traditional literature, if we have these strong comparisons. And there are several attempts, again, in psychology, uh, where enough replications have been conducted to be able to do a relatively um, fair comparison. So it can have an effect to do this. How can you personally benefit from this? And again, my personal perspective, I believe that you could um, be well prepared if you try to adopt open science practices now, because they are changing demands. Um, funding agencies, academic job applications, and also publications uh, outlets, publication outlets demand this more often to also um, share data, provide more information and so on and so far. So meet the demands. I believe that you still could get a competitive advantage because in sports science, you could still be one of the early adopters. Um, most of the, it's not that established at the moment. So you could still be a little bit ahead of time and getting early exposure, basically. <clears throat> I believe that you could also increase the credibility of your work um, because applying higher standards of the research practices, if you share them, you probably take them a little bit more seriously. We could more broadly help to create a more robust um, scientific literature, more robust findings, basically. So things that I talked about before, we could help to make the problems a little bit slower, a little bit smaller. And last but not least, <clears throat> I would suggest that you uh, learn by doing. For example, um, do one step at a time. You could also, and I have, did great uh, I have great experience with this, use student or thesis projects to try to implement this in a closed access, in a, in a, in a closed and non-public um, area. Only you and your working group can try to implement some of these practices to get some experience. If you feel comfortable enough, then apply this to the things that you will publish afterwards, all right? So this is also a very, very nice um, way of, you can, of how it can get used step by step. So now <clears throat> I would like us to go to a, a group work phase um, where you, well, I will show this here, then it gets a little bit more clear. 
basically you can decide based on topics of your interest um, if you for the, for the scenario, you want to get started applying one aspect of open science practices. For example, you wanted, uh, you, you're thinking about performing pre-registration, sharing data or materials, uh, performing science communication, so just opening the discussion a bit. Um, you are interested in, in, in creating or using open education materials, or for those who already are a little bit in, uh, experienced with applying some of the open science um, practices, can get together and discuss how get we more colleagues involved. Um, as a task in these groups, ask yourself two main aspects. What can you do individually now at the moment for the current projects running or for future projects? And what do you think are your personal barriers um, which could make it difficult or which make it impossible to apply some of the open science practices? And maybe your peers, your colleagues have some ideas how to overcome these. This is the basic idea. Um, we are going to uh, I try to organize this in the following way. This is me, this is the front of the desk. Um, those who are interested in uh, applying pre-registration, so basically how could we um, pre-register hypothesis, design protocols and so on, please come to the right hand, to the right front of this room, to the right back of this room, data sharing and data materials, scientific communi communications, uh, here in front of me, so front left. Um, if you're interested in using open access publications, social media engagement, uh, more interaction on conferences or uh, personal websites, basically, open education materials in the back left of this room, or for the experienced one in the middle of the room. So basically, at, at first step, I want to get an overview of who's interested in what. And if you are in this corner, go together in at, at maximum uh, six people. Okay, so that you get a small group discussing this topic. So for example, if uh, 20 people would be interested in pre-registration, we have uh, four to five groups of maximum six people, right? So you can get the discussion. Um, how you do this? I prepared um, some, some working sheets, which you can download, or which you can uh, use online using a smartphone or um, a laptop. So for example, for pre-registration, I have Google Sheets, which you can modify. Again, there's a brief task de description. You want to get started. You want to get started with pre-registration and you ask yourself, what can you do now? And what are the barriers? And you discuss this and um, you also take some notes that we can afterwards um, accumulate all this information and you can maybe learn from the experiences from the others. All right, that's the basic idea. So you can find these materials either with the um, overall repository or with uh, using this uh, short link on the right hand corner. And first of all, please move to the area of the room where you feel most comfortable of discussing how you could get started. You don't have to have any experience, all right? So please get up and first move to the room. You can then decide to go wherever you want for discussion. I initially also wanted to show you um, how you could use the open science framework to go to the different steps. I want to give you a very, very quick um, screenshot now, uh, in just like half a minute. And I will do a follow up recording of this like 10 to 15 minutes, basically, how you can apply the different things uh, from a technical perspective. So this will be a follow up, um, which I will upload to the repository. Um, we don't have time to go through everything there. There you go. So this is what we've talked about earlier. This is where I share all the materials from this workshop, the open science framework. You can very easily create uh, additional components. And this is what I'm going to do. But basically, the idea was from this poll, go through all the research process and I prepared everything. I made a small pre-registration on what I'm going to do with uh, this research poll, what my research idea was. I did a small uh, power analysis. We can collect data and so on. I show you open source software where you can analyze the data, where you can share different types of data. Um, as we heard today, data are often seen as um, summary statistics. So even sharing all your summary statistics for most people is more data than it's currently communicated, but also showing scatter plots where you can see the individual data points is more data than nothing. You don't always have to share the raw data to share data or more data than usually, even meta-analysis, we just use the summary statistics. So I'm going to show you some of the examples there in a, a walking through 
how you can use this. And basically you can organize everything here, um, create an DOI to have a perfect identifiable and database indexed um, repository. You can link different types of uh, other cloud providers and for example, organize your research in such a fashion, for example, all your planning documents can be there. They have timestamps. You can create real registrations there, which cannot be changed after the fact. Basically like a clinical trials.gov, but at this platform, um, you could share different aspects and I'm showing you all the different types that we could use, for example, with this poll data. To be, to be able to do so, the last question I would ask you is please fill out the poll again. For the second time, if you think um, that anything changed from the beginning of this workshop. All the follow-up information is provided afterwards over the Open Science Framework. Videos, the video recording of this, the slides, the materials, and so on and so far. So you can at least get um, some, some inspiration, some ideas of other things in our field that have been done. So you can take a look at what others are doing. As promised before during the workshop, this is the follow-up recording where we go through the steps of how you can get started with applying open science practices in your own research. So as a first step, I would recommend that you check out STORC, the Society for Transparency, Openness and Replication in Kinesiology, a group of people who are very interested and enthusiastic about open science and open science practices in sport and exercise science more broadly, or in the American language, the kinesiology. Check out their, uh, check out their, their Twitter um, platform, their YouTube channel. L lots of talks were uh, recorded on the topics related to open science. And yeah, also check out their, their website. We have some different journals and uh, preprint repositories specifically for sports science. So we'll definitely take a look there. As a next step, um, we will now go through the different, uh, I will show you how you can go through the different steps of a full research cycle and how we can do that um, openly, how we can publish that openly using the open science framework. And I showed you really quickly before that I created a repository for this entire workshop where all the materials will be stored. and. Um, not speaking too long, also go going directly to the open science framework to show you how we can get started. So I, as you have seen before, um, this is uh, the, the, the repository, the website basically for the entire workshop, the open science, uh, open sports science workshop at the ECSS, where I provided you with the different um, files required for the workshop, or at least uh, to, to follow up with the workshop. For example, the initial workshop proposal, if you were interested, what I originally planned, um, the slides, which will also be extended and updated, the documents for the group work, which are linked to the Google Drive. Um, I will take a look if you provided any notes there that I can um, summarize and share with you again. And then we can also create now uh, an another repository. So the basic thing is that we have some, some great metadata here. For example, um, you can see the latest versions when the project was created, the different contrib contributors. For example, as you can see, we can also assign a DOI, which only takes a couple of seconds if we are desired to do so. You can make a short description, which is good findable, and you can specify an, an license of how, how people can use or um, share your materials, basically. So if we want to create a repository for our um, short research cycle, research project, basically, usually it looks like this. If you start with the open science in the beginning, you can just press create a new project. And this is basically how you could get started creating a repository for a new project. In this case, we will go through the um, open science workshop repository and then create a new component because I want you to have all the materials linked quite closely together. So I'm creating a new component live as you can see right now. And I will call this the demo project. Science workshop ECSS 2022, just that everyone is aware of what is actually there. Um, I can look at where I want to store the data, where the, the data storage is located. So we have internationally um, various um, locations, basically. I can add the contributors of the main project and I can also add the text and I can choose a license. Um, it will, in this case, be the same license as before. I could also 
provide a description and a category. So for example, now I say this is a project. Um, yes. And now I create a new component. I go through the component and this is how it looks like if we um, start right now with a new process of uh, publishing data and publishing materials for a project. As you can see here, the original project was uh, is, is referenced because we created a component. This is the great thing about components. You can all directly link back to the, to the main project. We could create uh, small descriptions, which I will not do right now. And we have the um, Creative Commons by attribution license. So basically everyone can use all of the materials and do everything they want if the original resource is cited, including the authors. Currently, this repository is also private, so no one can see this. Um, we will make it public uh, upon completion. You could create a small wiki and also add um, or, or link to YouTube, basically, and directly there's a YouTube player integrated, which I can only show you later. And this is basically where we can store the different data. We will start by creating a structure in the beginning. So first of all, I create the first step of a project would be the pre-registration. So we create a pre-registration folder, which is basically in our terminology, problem and plan. There you go. So the first document, for example, would be that I will um, share the proposal, the original proposal. And I will upload this from the original project in a second. So as you can see, I just copied the uh, copy and pasted the original workshop proposal with the original timestamp. So you can see this is my original planning from uh, mid of January. The next step would be to create a pre-registration. And to do this, I've um, prepared a document, basically, which looks like a small report, whatever. And basically, um, this is where I outline the different informations that could be useful for pre-registration. So basically, uh, we have, of course, the title, contributors, um, some basic informations just that help you uh, navigate the different components. We just created the step-by-step -step, step example, and I also want to put a link there. And so let's take the new project component and paste the new link in there so that you have the link available in the future. Let's do some editing. There you go. So the different links to the original repository, the working group, and the step-by-step -step example. Also reference list, which I will mention later. This document contains of the different parts which we will go through. So basically we are now doing um, the entire research pro process and the pre-registration contains the problem and the plan, basically. So for example, based on the original proposal, I've um, inputted a small background, what the original aim was, um, or what the, what the background is, and the aim of this uh, small research, which we are using the poll for, was to analyze if the confidence in applying open science practices is increased at the end of the workshop. That was basically the thing why we did the poll before and afterwards. In addition to, I was just interesting of uh, what you guys already know and how confident you are um, at the beginning of the workshop. The plan is um, to analyze this question. Basically, we do a observational uncontrolled poll study uh, with pre-post design. The participants are the workshop attendees. For sample size, um, the main criterion is feasibility. So basically, I just can analyze the available participants. And based on the planning originally, I had no idea how many participants will be available at the latest part of the last part of this workshop. To do so, we're using Jamovi, a free and open source software, where I um, use the JPower module to create a small overview of how um, the power could look like in this study. The basic idea of using this pre-post pre data is that we are running a paired t-test, even if this might not be the best test based on the underlying um, data structure. Nevertheless, I wanted to test uh, one-sided. I want to see if there's an increase in knowledge or confidence. So the two questions, I just randomly select uh, the, the common alpha of 5% and a power of more than 90% and calculate the effect size that I'm able to see based on the available participants. And this is Jamovi. This is, for example, um, how one of the open source softwares look like. 
basically has um, some kind of SPSS structure, but um, a little bit more handy, I think. And for example, using the JPower module, we can easily create different types of power analysis. And in this case, I, um, as mentioned in the document, I wanted to have a desired power of 90%. In the, in the beginning, um, based on the original poll, there were roughly uh, 40 participants, alpha of 5%, and I want to test one-sided with the, um, the one-sided test. Um, wait, that's not really correct. The original poll only had 32 participants. Based on expected dropouts, I changed this to 25 participants. And with 25 participants at a pre-post comparison, one-sided testing, I would be able to um, detect effect sizes of 0.6 um, cones T basically with not, not more, at least 90% power. Great explanation, great way of um, performing power analysis, basically, and having a description of what you originally did. This is what you usually do when approving or applying for ethics. So therefore, these calculations and um, documents you should have. And the great thing about the software is, for example, you can very easily create um, PDF reports, basically, on uh, what you're interested in. And I will show you show this in a second. And you can also create HTML versions of the planning document. So for example, this is the PDF export from Jamovi, where you just have all the things that uh, were typed in there um, uh, exported as a PDF, which is really easy and nice to, to read. You could also um, put some more comments in there if you want. In addition, Jamovi makes it also very easy to create an HTML export. So basically an, something like a website um, document, which is even more easy to read because you can um, scale it at different uh, display sizes, which is really, really great tool. And everything's just there with free and open source software. And for example, these two documents, I can just drag and drop them to my new created component. There you go. And I can also use the reproducible um, Jamovi file. And the main informations are stored there as a pre-registration. So basically, if I would have done this upon um, creation of the project, this would be quite nice uh, to, to, to be verifiable of what I've planned before. So now we have the original proposal and the power analysis. Basically, don't, don't take me accountable for what, what the content is. I just wanted to show the, the basic idea and the, 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 the types you can do the things you can do with, with Jamovi. Back to the pre-registration project. Uh, for example, the details on the data collection, we use this poll. There's the link for the poll. The two questions specified with a like, like a type scale. So basically all the re relevant information of um, what actually was done. The analysis should be a confirmatory analysis with the hypothesis, primary hypothesis. Did the perceived competence in applying open science practices increased at the end of the workshop? And secondary, um, where the participants having a better understanding of what is open science. Again, we will perform the analysis with the Jamovi and the S key module, which I will show you later, also with the paired T test. And because I know the S key module don't is, is not able to do um, one-sided tests. Basically, we also use the 90% confidence interval two-sided, which is equivalent, basically, if we don't have overlap with the nil um, of a one-sided test with 5% alpha. And these are basically the main informations that you could put in the pre-registration. These are also these things that you uh, would need for applying for ethics, for example. So what you then do, you create a PDF version, so a non-modifiable, oh, wait, you, you create a PDF version of the, of the document. Then you can take this document, also put it to the Open Science Framework. So for example, uh, these could be the files that are included in a pre-registration where you at least have the basic hypothesis, the analysis plan ready, um, where you could easily include some uh, inf more, de more detailed information on the power analysis, basically. And now, since you have a timestamp document, you are basically ready to go to prove that you um, had the original 
hypothesis and a test plan before starting the research. And there's also a more formal way because, of course, we could have created 10 different pre-registrations and delete all the nine that don't match the final analysis. Um, so there's even a better way to do pre-registration. And of course, the Open Science Framework has a great tool for this. So for example, we can use the pre-registration -re options. And as you can see in a second, there are different versions of pre-registrations. The most easiest one, which, which we will do, is the open-ended registration, where basically the project as it is now, as it is at the time of registration, will be stored in a non-modifiable version. There are also other versions um, of pre-registration where you have various questions which you should answer, which uh, guide you basically through the to, to a process of good and detailed informations of uh, what makes a good pre-registration. For this purpose, we're using the open-ended registration. We create a draft of this where you basically say, um, this is the pre-registration of our demo project of the OSS workshop the description. This is a pre-registration of the demo project. Contributors, we could also change this if we desire. We could change the category. We could change the license. We again say we want to create everything as openly as possible. So we are using the, um, or almost as open as possible, we're using the Creative Commons by license, by attribution license. We could select different aspects. So we can assign different tags for the project. Then we can go through next. Again, make a brief summary of what is contained in this pre-registration. So in this project, we have sample documents for the pre-registration of the workshop poll study. And based on the documents, we're currently having the proposal, the power analysis, different versions, and the pre-registration. Uh, we are going to review this quickly. And when checking everything, we can register, register this one. And we can decide if we directly want to make the registration public, so immediately, or if we want to enter an embargo to this registration. There are different reasons for this, of course, too much details uh, for the short workshop. I will submit. So we have just created the pre-registration. We can now add this as a comp as add, add this pre-registration to the project. So for example, I can look at my registrations and I will then find the registration of the demo project. I can include this. And now it is also directly um, referenced in my project, my demo project um, repository as a component, basically. And you can see that registered documents, if I click on the pre-registration, there's everything timestamped and non-changeable. And we also have this public. So this is a very easy and great way of pre-registering things if you're interested in this. The next step is we perform the data collection and analysis and afterwards write up the report. So as the second part, we create a folder called data and analysis, where we will put all the data and analysis in there. So let's take a look. When we look at the poll, I received 55 responses. We are exporting the data and I've prepared um, transformation document basically. So these are the data. We can now proceed and copy all the data in the pre-prepared um, transformation file because we for Jamovi we need it from the long format to the, sh uh, to the wide format. Let's see if that works. So after a little bit of uh, some minor data cleaning, this is the data that we are going to use. So we are exporting this as a CSV. And again, I've created a analysis file with Jamovi with um, sample data. Now we can simply import the updated data file and all the pre-prepared analysis will be updated based on um, the previous analysis. 
So we make it just a little bit larger. So in the beginning, we have the t-test with knowledge from the beginning and the end of the workshop, we do see some kind of increase where we have the different data. And first of all, if we're talking about sharing data, I think the first uh, thing of sharing data is sharing all the different summary statistics that are relevant to your question. So for example, uh, Jamovi is also quite nice because um, we can also change things um, upon check. For example, if we want to do some assumption checks, we could also simply activate uh, normality, normality checks and QQ plots. So for example, data look quite normally distributed from the um, QQ, QQ plots. And also looking at Shapiro Wilk test, we don't find or the Kolmogorov Smirnov test, the test for normality, we don't find significant um, deviations from normality. And this is, for example, the details that could be relevant. And this would be the first from my understanding, this would be the first step towards more open data because usually we simply report something like um, maybe even a T statistics, but typically just a P value. And simply by recording, uh, by, by, by sharing all the different informations that are displayed here. So also the normality checks, also the figures, for example, this would be even more data than are usually shared. So this is the first step of sharing data, even if we don't share uh, anonymous data. And we can also create a PDF report and basically have um, and, and, are not, and are not required to share the original data set. The second step would be that we using a little bit more, um, more detailed tools, for example, by not just sharing the plots of the original, uh, the, of the summary statistics, but for example, using data visualizations that show the individual data, uh, the individual data points. So in this case, I use the S key model, um, which show all the individual differences, basically the summary statistics with the 90% confidence intervals and the individual differences with the different change scores. And it looks like we're having a quite um, okay effect for looking at the knowledge increase increment. And also when looking at the uh, change in confidence, let me see significant p-value that looks okay. And also the 90% confidence interval for saying, I was interested in um, looking at an increased confidence. Basically, we also see a positive effect. And again, we can export the results. So I'm first exporting this as a PDF document. So I'm exporting this as the analysis document. can also create an HTML version of the, of the analysis report. In addition to creating um, the, the PDF export or the HTML export of the full analysis report, we can also very easily export the images themselves. And we can then copy and paste the documents, the HTML PDF, documents basically also in the open science repository to also share some of our summary data and figures. So basically within the research project, uh, we would now after analyzing the data, write up the report and I've used basically the original information from the pre-registration and just called this report and added some other informations. So basically data analysis for transparent reporting, we can, what we just did, um, report the summary statistics, for example, in a PDF document. And then we could, in a report, include the figures as well. So basically, in a report of um, to, to share a little bit more data, it would be a good recommendation to share individual data points if you are visualizing this. So from my understanding, even when in a report showing individual data points, this would be more data sharing than, uh, than the common practice, even if you don't share the, the raw data files, for example. If we go to the next step of data and analysis files sharing, we could also share the reproducible Jamovi file. And in the Jamovi file, you have the original data and all the different analysis steps that you did. So if I upload the, this file and you open it with this Jamovi as well and the respective modules, you can directly reproduce everything that I've just done.
And from my perspective, only the last step would be to also share the original data files, which I will of course do in this case as well. So we have the data in the white format, which were analyzed and which had uh, the pseudonymization. And we can also, and I will also upload the transformation file. And last but not least, if we are using more sophisticated um, analysis software, we could also provide some code. And again, a nice thing about Jamovi is it runs basically on R. And Jamovi has the nice opportunity that we can activate the syntax mode. And then we directly have the R code available for the different packages and the different um, tests that we performed. So in this case, I also copy and pasted the R code, put some small annotations, and therefore we can also basically somehow um, publish the, the R code with our data. And when we look at the open science framework, we can see the different types and ways of how we could share different details of data and analysis. Back to the report, basically we have the different um, materials provided. We could also provide additional, uh, the different analysis provided. We also can provide additional materials such as the poll and the intervention, basically intervention where the workshop slides, which I will also upload and the group work documents. And basically when looking at the conclusions, um, I prepared again some statements and based on the analysis, I believe we could confidently say with this, all these limitations of the study that uh, we were able to create an increased open science knowledge and an increased confidence in applying open science practices, which of course is quite nice. So as a last part, the, the references, which would be more or less something like the last part of a report. Um, this is also something I wanted to share with you because I've created um, an, an open web library on the topic of open sports science, where you have different folders with lots of references um, oriented to or uh, separated to the different open science practices, also um, open and meta science in sport and exercise science, um, the materials for the workshop, also additional um, media like uh, podcasts, talks and workshops and Twitter, basically everything related to open science. So this is an open library, also an open source tool, an open source library tool, the Zotero, which you can use um, on the web browser and which there are also desktop versions for Microsoft, for Mac and also for Linux. So also as an appendix, this was the last aspect of the research cycle uh, dissemination. For example, we could publish as a, as, a, as a larger part of publication, um, we could open access, publish our repository, which we are just, which we just did. As a second part, we could use social media to openly communicate what we have done. So for example, I tweeted uh, prior to the workshop and uh, shared, shared the materials and also the links. This is an easy way of how you could openly communicate um, the things that you did. Another thing is that you, uh, as, uh, as we will do in the follow-up, we will share the, the materials. You can also try to publish open access, for example, and um, we will create this as a report. Um, when you create reports and manuscripts and submit these to the articles, um, you are usually allowed to post preprints and you can also usually self-archive the postprints or the accepted um, manuscripts after peer review. This is a link where you can take a look at what the journal and publisher policies are. This is a great database where you can find um, which type of manuscript you are allowed to share. Most of the time, again, you are allowed to freely and open accessly publish the preprint and the postprint, even with closed access journals. For example, you could use the Sport Archive, which is a um, open which is a sports science repository. Where we basically where the where the stock society where we publish um, pre and post prints in, in sports science. There are also other ways of publishing open access. The ideal version would be Diamond Open Access, where it's free to publish and also to read, where basically the funding um, comes from from other areas than uh, author processing charges. And for example, also Stock created a, a journal, the Communications and Kinesiology which currently runs over the Diamond Open Access platform. Another thing is you could engage in open peer and post-publication peer review. So for example, you can comment on preprints, which is a great view of debating, and you can engage in post-publication peer review, for example, using platforms like PubPeer, 
And this is a very great tool. So for example, if we look at a very um, famous open science publication, why most published research findings are false, we do see with the PubPeer browser plugged in that there are several comments on the PubPeer platform, for example, five comments, which um, very intensely um, reanalyzed and tried to reanalyze an argument against some of the statements from the original author. And this is great. We have a, a published research here where we can see that other researchers also conducted some research and commented and published on um, published their, their critiques, basically, or their arguments uh, against the original statements after peer review. And this is how science can involve. This is how post-publication peer review could look like. So definitely um, check out PubPeer and install their browser plugins because everywhere you go and every time you find some references with DOIs attached, you can see that PubPeer finds um, open comments at their database. And last but not least, um, also you can always think about what could be useful for others to share. You can put this into the supplementary files, uh, into the supplementary, supplementary materials. You could use the Open Science Framework to publish other materials um, in addition to the main manuscript. And this is how we could make science open very easily with a very easy platform using the Open Science Framework. So looking at our repository, we have now um, created a repository which um, contains pre-registration of the different documents, which contains data and analysis files, um, which contains the report and which contains suppl supplementary material from our intervention basically. And basically the report document could be a preprint, could be a postprint of your manuscripts, which are all openly shared and which basically um, contain all the different steps uh, where we tried to make everything about the research process a little bit open and I hope this is an, uh, an, easy, uh, an easy example uh, that you can see, you can do everything with the Open Science Framework basically. So the last aspects I want to show you, for example, also a great tool for directly getting to citations with all relevant information in different citation styles. And as mentioned before, you can um, link the Open Science Framework to other providers. For example, I was directly able or you are di directly able to connect uh, Zotero libraries. You could also connect um, OneDrive, Dropbox, and so on and so forth if you want to um, use other storages. And as mentioned in the beginning, um, currently this project is private, so only I can see it. So you can use the Open Science Framework to um, create a workflow that works for you. And then if in the end, if you decide that you are confident enough to share this with the world, you can um, make this public and only when it's um, when, when you decide that you want to share this um, it's it's ready for publication and now we have basically created a full open repository of a small study um, including all different aspects like the timestamped pre-registration and finally we can also create a DOI basically which makes this um, this project perfectly citable and, and I hope you and I, I hope that um, this was an informative and helps you get started with your research project. So as a concluding statement, the last thing I want to mention is um, that I've also prepared some examples of uh, how we can share our research more open access. Basically, I've created one slide where there are uh, different types of things that we can publish that we can use to disseminate and debate our research and other materials um, more openly. And as you can see with the links, um, there are different, ex I, I've provided some different examples if you want to take a look how others or I um, performed these things. So let's open science together. <laughs>